All right. Um, this is uh, Roman from Palamida. I would like uh, to welcome everyone uh, to the webinar. Um, I would like to very quickly do a spot check if uh, my audio is OK. Sounds like it is. Um, so uh, today's webinar is a joint webinar uh, between the Palamida and Brown Rudnick. Uh, today we're having uh, Jeff Lush, founder and CEO of Palamida, and uh, Edward Nothen, uh partner in Brown Rudnick. Uh, and the topic of today's webinar is how to set expectations around open source usage in your company. Um, in the very beginning, I will turn it uh, very quickly to the presenters. So, um, uh, Jeff, uh, please, uh, if you could do a very short introduction to Palamida, and then I'll turn it over to Ed to do a short introduction of uh, Brown Rudnick. Thank you, Roman. Thanks so much, and thanks everyone for joining us today. As Roman said, my name is Jeff Lush. I'm the founder of Palameda. Uh, Ed and myself today will be giving a talk on how to set expectations around your open source usage, and a little bit about Palameda. We've been around for about 11 years now, and we are a software and services company. We help basically people track and manage their use of open source and other third-party software, including commercial libraries. Uh, we sell software. We also help people with merger and acquisition work, baseline work, and selection of open source components. So if you have any questions about that, please do contact us afterward. And with that, maybe I'll turn this over to Ed if you can give us a little information about uh, Brown Rudnick. Sure. Hi, this is Edward. I am uh, a partner in uh, the IP and litigation practice at Brown Rudnick. I'm in the Boston office. We have offices, though, in across the U.S. and in London and Paris. Um, and for about the past 15 years, I've uh, advised companies and clients on open source issues, um, helped them adopt policies and strategies, have helped companies shift from a proprietary model to a to an open source model, and um, have have dealt with open source in in in, in many other contexts, uh, and not infrequently, it's in the context of mergers and acquisitions uh, as well, or some other kind of transaction. I'm glad to be here today. And um, Thank you. I know from, yep, sorry about that. Um, thank you, thank you, Edward, sorry. Um, just very quickly, we would like uh, to do a short overview of the uh, questions that we have asked uh, during the registration. So um, the first question um, uh, that we have asked uh, what is your current perceived risk of open source compliance today? And um, as we can see, we have um, received about uh, 20 different answers. And as you can see, the um, uh, answers are distributed in a pretty much linear fashion from high uh, to low to medium. Next question, um, which of the following most uh, closely describes your interest in attending this seminar? And um, we are seeing here, again, a distribution. Most of the people are interested in the compliance and risk management, uh, which is great because we have Edward today. And in the end of the webinar, you can see, uh, you can ask him all the questions. Um, what does describe the level of open source awareness within your company? Um, so as you can see, there's another interesting uh, outcome of this uh, question. And uh, some people. Uh, most of the people on the webinar today uh, have a very good awareness of uh, the uh, open source, which is great. So um, we would also be running a number of poll questions. And at this point in time, I would like to run the first uh, poll uh, question. So if everyone could prepare uh, for uh, the vote. Okay, perfect. Now I will share the answers with everyone. 
Sounds good. Okay, I will now run one more question, which is uh, probably a bit more interesting. Okay, thank you everyone for uh, voting on the first question. I'm sharing the results of uh, the vote uh, right now. And uh, just a quick remind everyone uh, before we uh, start the webinar, if you have any questions at any point of time, please feel free to ask those questions at the uh, GoToWebinar uh, questions box right on the right-hand side of your screen. And we will address them in the end of the webinar. At this point, I would like to turn it over to uh, Jeff uh, for his uh, first part of the presentation. Hi, Roman. Actually, I think Edward is going to be going first today. Okay, sorry about this. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Roman. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, quick overview of what it is that um, I want to cover. I know from the from the poll. Edward, I think yep. we're not seeing your slides. If you can share your screen. All right. Um, there we go. Are you seeing it now? All right. Let's see. Roman, I think you need to not share the poll results anymore, and then we might be able to see um, Ed Swett. Perfect. All right. Sorted that out. So thank you again, everyone. Um, quick overview of what it is that uh, I wanted to uh, cover today. I realize that um, from the polls that uh, many of you already have good familiarity with open source issues and are looking for a more practical guide to uh, to dealing with the, the issues that come up. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on preliminary background things. I'm going to uh, assume most of you are, have some familiarity with it. Um, so I'll talk a bit about uh, why um, the open source compliance matters, how the issues can arise, some of the challenges that uh, uh, clients and companies encounter, um, and some uh, uh, recommendations and elements for, uh, for a compliance program. From uh, at, the, at the start, this is the brief introduction to the terminology. I will uh, be using, uh, I'll, I'll probably be using the shorthand uh, uh, either open source or FOSS. Uh, but there are, I, I'm very aware of the, the two different um, worldviews in the, in the community. Um, the free software approaching um, software uh, freedom as an ethical uh, matter and the open source uh, initiative that takes a, um, takes a view of it more of a, as a development uh, methodology and a way to create better software. Um, if I refer to it simply as is open source, uh, it's a slip up, but um, uh, I am aware of both those issues. Um, and I'll be talking about the licenses uh, in, in sort of categorical terms. I'll refer to the copyleft licenses, which are the ones, of course, that require the licensee to distribute derivative works under the same license and, and may place other restrictions uh, on the, uh, the licensee. Uh, and, and contrasting those with attribution licenses, which uh, generally generally allow users to um, the licensee to use the code in in broad ways, um, so long as the copyright notice and the warranty disclaimers are included. Um, the classic copyleft license, of course, is the general public license or the GPL, 
and the attribution licenses are the Berkeley Software Distribution, the BSD, um, and uh, Apache are two of the most well-known. Those licenses, or the open source licenses, may also have additional obligations. May, in addition to uh, attribution, uh, may require making the availability, making source code available uh, upon the occurrence of certain triggers. It may include uh, covenant not to sue or uh, defense of suspension, or may even include an express patent license. And along this, in this quick view of the spectrum, we've got the uh, attribution licenses over there on the left in green. Um, Mozilla Public License, the LGPL, the Eclipse Public License have, uh, have weaker copyleft elements, and the stronger copyleft uh, licenses are uh, GPL V2 and V3 and the uh, AFRO GPL. Now, when I um, first uh, started to see discussion of free and open source software in the legal community, there was a good deal of, uh, of fear, uncertainty, doubt, uh, emphasis on the risk, and um, uh, a pressure, perhaps, uh, to opt out. Uh, the discussion around open source and free software has become much more sophisticated and nuanced now, and I think uh, the reality is that uh, opting out just isn't realistic. Open source software is indispensable, it's pervasive, uh, and the odds are very good that your developers are already uh, using it. Uh, open source software uh, requires compliance, but so too does uh, commercial. Uh, commercially licensed code. And these days I think um, people are seeing open source compliance more as, a, as an operational challenge than it is uh, strictly a legal one. And so what I hope to be able to do today is to give you some uh, guidance on how to take that operational challenge and to, uh, to address it. Most of the time uh, companies uh, have an open source policy, whether they have uh, have uh, uh, considered it or not. Sometimes they, uh, sometimes it's in writing. Sometimes it's uh, it, it's not so much. Um, larger companies are perhaps better at putting together the written policies and addressing issues, but um, that's not to say that uh, small companies and younger companies can't as well. In developing an open source policy, it becomes important to involve uh, key stakeholders. That's uh, that's going to be legal, it's going to be engineering, it's going to be uh, perhaps HR because uh, of, of the importance of um, maintaining a, uh, or, or the effect of your open source policy might have on your recruitment. Um, it is important to involve those stakeholders in a, in a discussion where you identify what's the problem that you need to solve. Is it, uh, are you trying to develop a, a policy or do you need a policy that's just at a very high level of general principles? Uh, rules uh, about not using uh, open source code or other third party code without an approval? Or is it one that requires uh, an operational how-to kind of document with detailed, much more detailed rules? Uh, some of it will depend on what the company's risk profile is. Uh, if, if a company uh, is a software company uh, and uh, software is critical to their business, um, they will have a different approach than a company that has uh, developed you know, some homegrown software for their own internal use or not for uh, uh, not for commercial purposes and something that's less uh, central to the business. But ultimately, the open source policy has to be aligned uh, to the company's business model. Uh, it has to, uh, if, if the company's uh, going to be um, offering multiple products that include uh, open source code under different licenses uh, or under an open source license itself, uh, you'll have a policy that's different than one where most of the uh, 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 the code uh, is is used internally, most of the, or the code is under distributed under a proprietary model. Um, you'll need to have that discussion with all of the key players and develop a real operational process about how to address uh, the issues uh, presented by uh, open source. And the roles and responsibilities should be clearly delineated uh, where you know, there's roles for legal, there's roles for engineering, there's roles for, for uh, 
the, the development and the sales team, the product leads, um, the folks who uh, are interfacing with uh, your, your customers or your business partners um, to help understand and make sure that there's buy-in uh, and an agreement on the, on the overall uh, approach to the policy. The issue of oh, questions about open source can arise in uh, a, a number of different ways. Sometimes it's a developer who's asking uh, whether certain code, third-party code, can be incorporated into the code base. There might be an inquiry from uh, a third party uh, or a request uh, that there be a notice of attribution uh, in your documentation or on the splash screen. Um, you may be doing uh, a review and audit a scan uh, of, the, of a product in, prior to its release, or the issue may come up in the context of a transaction, perhaps an M&A transaction, perhaps uh, some other kind of uh, technology transaction. And in setting up the, the program to deal with uh, the compliance issues, again, uh, executive buy-in is critical. Uh, it becomes also, many companies have found, in, in my, my experience, many companies have, have found it uh, helpful if there are going to be multiple uh, products, uh, use, uh, multiple software products and different open source licenses in, involved, there may be a director of open source who will, be, uh, who will have the ownership of dealing, uh, addressing the issues or establishing and enforcing the open source policy. Um, other times, it, it's not, um, there isn't someone with that particular uh, title. It might be the chief technology officer is one of his responsibilities or her responsibilities will be to deal with this. Um, but generally, it, it becomes important to have someone who is the sponsor because otherwise engineering may say, hey, I thought legal was going to take care of that. And legal might say we didn't realize there was an issue because engineering didn't tell us. So. Uh, very often there's a, an open source, a kind of open source committee, an open source review board, uh, or some open source working group that includes the sponsor, representatives of the engineering team, the product team, and the legal team. It's important in developing your compliance program to try to keep uh, that process lightweight and not overly intrusive, otherwise it, uh, or overly burdensome, let's say, because then it, uh, it then it's the developers and the engineering team just uh, it's, are more inclined to avoid it. It also is very helpful to uh, integrate the open source compliance uh, into the development process. Uh, perhaps there'd be an open source um, checkpoint in the course of a, of a product release product um, in connection with or around the time of a, of a code quality review, for instance. Another challenge that, that, that becomes uh, or to face in developing the policy is to deal with the issues of communication. Uh, education around open source is, uh, is, it can be a challenge. Uh, there are developers who think they, they know about open source, but they just simply regard open source as all public domain. There may be developers who think that open source is you know, viral and must be avoided. Um, training, internal training, whether it's a formal kind of training for new developers, whether it is a, um, a training about introduction to free and open source software and their licenses or introduction to the company's uh, compliance program. Uh, or brown bag lunches, talking uh, about how to uh, uh, how to what the company's view is with regard to open source or the policy is with regard to a particular product. Uh, very often, a way to centralize this is to have uh, on a company internet or a SharePoint site uh, a portal that has information for developers and engineering. It sets out the open source policy that may have the forms that would be used to request a, uh, to use open source code, uh, perhaps a repository of code that has already been pre-approved. Uh, perhaps there would be um, a repository as well for attribution notices uh, to be used in connection with uh, certain licenses. Um, all of that helps to uh, ensure some cons consistency and uh, sustainability across uh, across the organization. 
external communication is important too, very often. Um, uh, one of the benefits uh, of using open source is the, the, to generate a, a robust community. Uh, an org a company may want to uh, be involved in the community. Uh, it, may, it also makes sense often to have an open source page uh, that can be used uh, as the portal for distributing source code if that's required and generally uh, uh, promoting the company's commitment to, uh, to free and open source software. So the, the, the challenge becomes establishing a baseline. It's one thing if uh, you're at the, uh, on, a, on a clean slate and you haven't started development yet, um, and you can begin keeping track of uh, every component that you use. But most of the time we're coming to this uh, and there's already uh, quite a bit of uh, water over the dam, as it were. Um, and so at some point it becomes necessary to sort of take stock of what, uh, what open source code has already been incorporated into a code base. Uh, and to begin to keep sort of contemporaneous records of, of uh, the inbound uh, third-party code, um, you know you can get this inbound third-party code from uh, from you know, product development. Developers pull down the code from the from the web. It may come from uh, contractors, independent contractors, or temps. It may have. Uh, been something that IT had been using uh, for an internal infrastructure that finds its way into the development base. It might be from a, a distribution partner um, and becomes important to sort of capture, and some of it may be commercially licensed code. Uh, the issue most of the time is that commercially licensed code usually, the licenses usually go through legal, and the challenge that open source presents is that the, it, they very often do not go through legal but just are uh, selected um, and used by the developers themselves. So uh, in th the best practices are to begin to establish uh, a record uh, whenever open source is used in connection with uh, a product. That way there can be keep track of, uh, uh, of the request, uh, the license that governs the code, the approval, um, and the way to uh, make sure that you have it in uh, in a bill of materials at the at the time that you do that, you could also uh, set aside the attribution notice um, so that you know you have it in a in a central place when it comes time to to do the documentation or the the splash screen or other um, attribution. Um, audits are the next, uh, the other way, because most of the time you haven't met many organizations don't already have the record of inbound uh, usage of open source and so it becomes necessary to do an audit, whether it's a, uh, a, a scan, um, and that of course is the most um, common way to, to get an understanding of what's in the code base. Um, or you may require it in connection with, or the issue may arise in connection with an acquisition uh, where you're requiring the, 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 uh, the target company to provide uh, a list of its open source in connection with due diligence or perhaps uh, if it's not an acquisition, some other kind of uh, uh, development uh, transaction where you require the, uh, the party that you're working with to give a full disclosure of their, uh, of their open source so that you can have started to create the baseline and understanding um, what it is that uh, is already in your code base. The next um, challenge then, of course, is maintaining compliance. You get the, that snapshot from that first uh, audit um, and you can create and, and compile uh, the, the complete uh, bill of materials and a list of all the open source and third party code you've used. Uh, but it's very rarely, uh, almost all of those are going to be evolving over time. There'll be changes made to the, uh, the code that is uh, that's in, as you go from version 1.0 to 1.1, there'll be um, new code added, there'll be changes, there may be new open source uh, uh, components released and, and those new packages, um, uh, new versions of the open source code uh, incorporated into your base. and it, that's why it becomes necessary um, and as a best practice to just continue um, to maintain the processes to to identify um, uh, the open source that may be integrated into your base, to um, enforce the rules, to get the approvals, and 
perhaps even to conduct an audit uh, from time to time or a scan from time to time, even if uh, it's not in connection with uh, uh, a transaction, maybe uh, uh, in connection with a product release, uh, for instance. So high-level elements of a compliance program start with uh, the identification of the code, uh, the scanning and the review of the code to understand what issues there are, addressing those issues, recording uh, the, how those issues have been resolved, um, and then providing notices and code to the extent that they are, are um, required by the licenses. And so the identification of code, with the request to use code, you uh, and, and very often there will be some po in the policy there will be guidelines about whether li certain licenses are acceptable, certain um, licenses are not. Um, sometimes it needs to be, uh, there's a safe harbor and you've already listed uh, that there are certain licenses that are okay. There are others that require a case-by-case -case determination uh, in view of the license and in view of the, uh, uh, the nature of the product and the, and the revenue model. There is, of course, you know, if uh, open source code being used by your IT team for the internal infrastructure creates different issues than uh, something that might be incorporated into a product that's shipped. And so all of those sorts of considerations um, become important. But, you know, identifying the code, the, the third-party code that's in conducting an audit, scanning um, the code, finding the propri your proprietary code, a third party code that may be commercially licensed uh, and uh, free and open source software it uh, it really sometimes the the review or the out the audit or the scan will be done more on a on a component basis but in most of the time it it needs to be done on a file by file basis to make sure that uh, you've captured all of the uh, open source code that might uh, not be apparent if they're doing a higher level. Uh, scan. And from this kind of scan, you can have, you generally will have an output uh, that includes a, a bill of materials or a list of an inventory of all of the uh, third-party uh, code that is included in the code base, uh, often and typically a list of the licenses that govern that third-party code, uh, identification of license conflicts, uh, and then uh, usually there's some uh, files or code uh, that's not been identified. It's a, it's an uncertain pedigree, or it's uh, not sure which uh, license would apply. And that's when you have to sort of sit down and figure out how to deal with this. It may be sitting down for those uh, for the code that uh, where the license isn't apparent. You may need to trace back and uh, look at the. Uh, Look at the source repository um, and the and the build notes to see how that who was responsible for incorporating the code and trying to track down where it, uh, where it came from and what license might apply to it. Other times, um, you know what license applies to it. You've figured out that it's a, a maybe a weak copy left license, and you need to have the discussion between legal and the development team and and management to to uh, make a determination about whether the incorporation of that uh, of code subject to that license uh, poses a risk uh, that's acceptable or whether there's issues there or that uh, can't be resolved. In that case, you may need to uh, make an assessment with engineering of how important that, this, uh, that, that code is to your product, whether there are alternatives available that you could use uh, to replace it and remediate uh, if that, uh, if it poses, a, a, if it's subject to a license that's not uh, one that's acceptable or would put your proprietary IP at risk. Um, and those are the kinds of decisions and discussions that uh, end up having uh, frequently uh, if, uh, as, as, uh, as this happens, if you uh, d discover those in your code base. You have a hard discussion sometimes to make a determination about um, risks and, and delays of releases and, and so forth. Um, for those licenses that um, aren't readily apparent, um, you need to review those licenses, track them down. It may be, for instance, that uh, a piece of code that uh, may have been released under 
multiple licenses, and in that case, it again becomes important to speak to the developer to make sure you know which project it came from and whether it was released under, say, the, the GPL or whether it might also have been released under Apache. Um, you'll need, in the course of the review and, and the consideration of uh, what to do, you'll need to identify whether the code has been the, the, the open source code has been modified or whether it's just been included as is, because uh, if there have been modifications made to the code that will have uh, different, uh, can trigger different obligations than um, simply the inclusion of it, particularly with regard to um, some of the weaker copyleft licenses. Uh, it becomes important as well to, to understand uh, the, the linkages and the dependencies. How uh, is the, uh, how, what is the architecture? Is the, uh, what's the interaction between the open source code and the proprietary code? Uh, how is it linked? Um, all of that discussion to make sure you could understand uh, where there are issues, where there are conflicts, and some of the different ways that they might be resolved. Again, with regard to obligations of, of complying with the obligations under the licenses, uh, if you've got the process set up so that it, all of this is noted at the time there's a request to include code in the code base, you can, it makes life an awful lot easier for the, uh, the, the documentation team and others in, uh, to make sure that they've included all of the required notices. Um, in fact, uh, it's sort of a best practice to kind of set up a, a kind of tracking system, much like you'd use for uh, tracking bugs, where you'd have uh, the, the request uh, comes in, or have the, the applicable license included with the code, and a record of the approval, and, and again, the record of uh, what needs to be included in the, uh, in the documentation, or a splash screen, or, or other notices. Um, in that also allows you to um, to comply with the obligations uh, with regard to source code distribution. Uh, you can have the you'll have that code in one place, and you can make it available uh, on your uh, on your portal if that's the way uh, that you're going to be making the uh, the code available for requests. There, I've been talking a bit about this uh, about this as a bit of a high level because so much of it does depend on uh, whether strong copy left code is acceptable in your code base or whether it's not. Um, there are documents. Uh, the Linux Foundation has a number of sample documents, templates, uh, documents that uh, you might use for an OS, uh, open source review board uh, approval of a request to use code or a, a record of keeping track of uh, the notices and obligations and some other guidelines for practices. You can find that at uh, Linux Foundation. Uh, .org, um, a number of different templates there that are very helpful. And uh, with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to, to Jeff. Well, thank, thank you, Edward. Appreciate that. That was a really, really interesting talk there. Thank, thank you very much, I'm gonna, Edward. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna we have, we're having a two, more, two, questions, two questions for Edward. Uh, so um, before Jeff starts, we will, uh, I would like to kind of uh, continue the, this conversation. Um, so the first question is, what is patent license and how does it affect a company's plan to adopt an open source package? Uh, some open source licenses have express patent licenses in them that say that to the extent that you incorporate this code, uh, or code subject to this license into your product and you distribute it, you expressly uh, grant a license to any uh, IP rights, including not just copyrights, but also patent rights that may be, uh, that may, um, that would be infringed by the code that you contribute. The other licenses don't have other open source licenses, particularly the GPL version 2, does not have an express patent license. It's, uh, there's a, and there's a good deal of discussion about whether there is an implied patent license uh, within, that, within the GPL v2. Um, GPL v3 makes the patent license more explicit. Um, the short answer, though, is that you, it, you need to be very mindful of what um, the implications are uh, for, your, for your patents. Uh, or each license has different implications for your patents, and some of them may 
uh, give you an express, uh, you may be giving a, an express grant to um, all the downstream distributees to be able to, to use your IP. Um, and that uh, is something, of course, that you'll need to consider. And that's why it makes sense in considering the open source, uh, whether you use certain open source code, whether you might want to include your, uh, you know, the, the, the attorney or other person who manages your patent portfolio. And then I, I think uh, I see the second question. Yeah, that we have for the second question. So uh, do you find that compliance control is generally done earlier or later in the software development life cycle? In my experience, it's done later. Um, <laughs> and most of the time, uh, clients wish they had done it earlier um, because, uh, of course, the software development life cycle and release dates are, are so important. And having an issue arise late in the cycle uh, can really throw things off. So most of the time, most of the time, it arises at least for a company in the first instance, late in the cycle, and uh, hopefully they will learn um, to sort of put in place these processes to catch the issues earlier in the cycle, um, so that they don't have as much of an impact on uh, on schedule and so forth. Thank you very much. Uh, just uh, one last uh, question that came in a second ago. Is open source policy contradictory to intellectual property policy? I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it is um, contradictory to it, but the two have to be, uh, the two are so interrelated. If you're going to, uh, you know, your choice of what licenses you will use or allowed to, to govern your code has, has real um, implications for the, your protection of your IP. Uh, uh, there are other ways in which it interacts. For instance, if you allow a developer, uh, one of your developers, to participate in um, a community project, uh, an open source community project, you'll need to be, um, you want to have given some thought to how to make sure that uh, any proprietary technology uh, that that developer is exposed to doesn't find its way into uh, a community project that's governed by a um, a license that uh, is copyleft because that's a uh, that would be a that would be a big problem. So uh, open source policies generally have to be uh, developed with a uh, very careful eye towards the company's IP policy and strategies. All right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I see one more question, but we will leave it after um, uh, the uh, Jeff's part. So uh, I would like to very quickly run uh, two uh, poll, polls right now. So please, everyone, uh, prepare. All right, thank you. Um, I will share the results of the poll. And we will run. Looks like we may have uh, some technical difficulties. We'll see if Roman can get back um, on the net here. Sorry about that. I'm here, Jeff. Uh, we're just waiting for everyone to vote. Yeah, Roman, we don't see your screen right now, so I don't know if the network popped. Yeah, there we go.
All right, I will close this poll right now. So thank you, everyone, for voting and share the results. Okay, um, at this point of time, I would like to turn it over to uh, Jeff. So Jeff, uh, I'm making your presenter. Edward, thank you very much for uh, your part. And It's my pleasure. Happy to, if there are questions afterwards, happy to answer them, or you have my email address if you want to follow up. Thanks very much. Hey, thanks, everyone. And this is Jeff Lush, uh, founder of Palomita. I'm going to act a bit of a, a bookend here on Edward's presentation to basically show what we're seeing out in the field. So Edward, Edward talked about why, why should we do this, often you know, ways that, that you can implement this in your organization, ways to make it successful. I want to give a, some, some numbers and some statistics about what we're actually seeing in the field. And, and I find that this often can help us who are trying to get compliance programs put in place. Uh, to give us a little more ammunition in terms of talking to engineering staff or executive staff or business or legal staff. Uh, so I'm going to go through this fairly quickly just in the interest of time. Uh, do let me know if there's any questions um, at the end. We'll have, a, we'll have a, a, a little bit of time there as well as uh, any follow-up on Edward's side as well. So the, fir the first thing that I always like to show um, is, is some statistics about why do we audit source code. You know, Edward talked about performing software audits and the importance of that. Uh, and, and I couldn't agree anymore. Obviously, being here from Palomita, I'm, I'm a strong believer of software audits and, and software scanning. Um, but the, I, I think the numbers back, back this, this up. Uh, whenever we go out to a company, and we are asked to perform a software audit where somebody says, please, please come in, scan our code, do your analysis, and tell us what we're actually using. We often find that we're going to be at least double and usually 10 times to 100 times more content than they knew about coming into the audit. So if they knew about 10 open source libraries, we're going to find 100, sometimes even 500 open source libraries. And the graph you see on the screen here is, is basically some data that we run once a year. Uh, we, we look uh, right before our user group and say, uh, let's look at the statistics of the project coming in. And the orange items are libraries that we found that the organization had no idea that they were using. And blue are the libraries that they knew they were using. And what you see is the vast majority of companies do not currently have a bill of materials that is in a shareable condition. You know, there may be an email, there may be a spreadsheet, but there's nothing that they, are, they feel is accurate or shareable with either Palomita or their customers or anyone like that. Um, and, and even in the cases where they do have a list, we're at least going to double it, and often, often 10x it or 100x. I think this is an important statistic because, first off, it shows just uh, how little insight we have into what, what's going out the door. Um, these days, what we see is uh, organizations are anywhere from 20 to 50 percent open source, with a lot of organizations weighing in about 50 percent open source code, but they don't know what they're shipping. And you know, we, you've seen the steady drumbeat of the security concerns that we've seen lately. Uh, and, and, and basically what that shows us is that people outside the organization might have a better understanding about what open source you're using than you do inside. So people are coming in basically saying, we want to know what's in there, why? Obviously licensing, patents, security is becoming a bigger and bigger deal and often is a, a great way to get uh, open source compliance into your organization in cases where perhaps Maybe, maybe you're doing software as a service, and the company says, oh, I'm, not, I'm not interested in doing this right now. We're not shipping something. Well, you probably have a couple hundred open source libraries, and our experience has shown that most of those are really old and um, have not been updated since they've been put into the organization. Um, also, there's a bigger concern with suppliers. What are your, what are your commercial partners giving you? If, if you haven't made your contract say that they need to tell you all the open source they're shipping you, probably a time to do that. It's an easy thing to get into your contract. It's an easy thing to uh, do some spot checks. And if they're not following, you can put a little pressure on them. Because if you ship it, uh, even if it's coming from a supplier, you have the responsibility to comply with it. So, so why, are people, why are most people not prepared? Well, there is still an incredible lack of open source knowledge out there. 
Uh, I, I always say if you, if you go out and you take your middle middle fifty percent of your developers, go take them out to lunch, you know, get some pizza, get some whatever. Um, ask them some pointed questions about licensing. You're not going to like the answers that you hear. There's going to be a lot of folklore. There's going to be a lot of shaking head saying, I, you know, I just don't know. I just don't think about that. There's going to be a lot of just wrong information. You know, people misusing the word public domain when they really mean general public license, or using free when they really mean open source. Um, education is the only thing we can do in some ways to, to really change, change this. Um, the universities have not been doing, I think, a good job in preparing the students for, for the, the new world of open source. Companies have kind of just assumed that the developers are picking it up out there on the streets. And, and I think it, 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 for all the scanning in the world, if you don't have it matched up with an education program, you're probably not going to do well. So um, definitely teach your developers, not just when they get onboarded, but once a year. You know, just like we do for all the various trainings that we do uh, about suppliers and ethics and things like that. I'm, I'm a strong believer of once a year, everyone should at least get a 15 minute or half an hour presentation about the importance of open source. Maybe a little bit about licensing, a little bit about trademarks, a little bit about patents. But just make sure that it's not being ignored because we need to do continuous improvement in all our processes. And, and, and then speaking of processes, people love sharing, but they hate process. So the, the simpler we can make this, that's great. But at the same time, um, it's OK to have some process. You know, we have process around the food that we eat. We have process around the building standards. Uh, software is one of the most important things that we do these days. And if we don't have process that means we, uh, that allows us to trust what's in there and what allows us to know what's in, what we're actually going out the door, um, you know, we don't really probably end up, we don't really own what we think we own. Um, let's talk about uh, some, some, some new things that have changed. Well, GitHub, if you're not familiar with this, this is one of the big, amazing repositories of open source code that's out there. There's tens of millions of open source projects. Uh, the, the issue with GitHub, it's so easy to share. People love using GitHub to share. It's so easy to share a single routine all the way up to a, a complete operating system. Well, until recently, they were not enforcing any sort of licensing selection. And even now, it's, a, it's an option. It's not a requirement. And what, what you find is only about 20% of projects out there on GitHub seem to have any declared license. So what, what that means is your developers are, are going out to GitHub, finding the best project, saying, this is exactly what I want to use, exactly what I want to ship. Well, there's no clear licensing for many of those projects. And this is confusing to the developers, because they see it out there on GitHub. This is a place where people are explicitly going to share. And they're, they're not getting, you know, the, the, it's not always helpful for them in terms of understanding what's required of them, what's the obligations, et cetera. And, and many developers have a mis mistaken understanding, which is, if I don't see a license, I'm free to use it. You know, in reality, the opposite is, which is, if you don't have a license, you have no permission to use it. And so that's something we have to train our developers, train anybody who's involved with the creating of our, 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 our projects here. It's a very simple phrase. Um, that, I, that I find, you know, simple is better. So things, you know, you, you know, having our developers understand, no license, no use. If we, if we can't take, figure out what the license is, it can't be used in our project. So, you know, just because it's available doesn't mean you have permission to use it. it it's something that I call visible source. Visible source is not open source. Uh, you can see it, you can look at it, you can run it, but you don't have any permissions to ship it, modify it, et cetera. And it, just because it's freely available doesn't mean you have any permissions to use it. I can, I can go get a lot of things off of commercial websites, but it doesn't mean I'm allowed to, to, to incorporate it into my product. Public domain is a phrase that we hear so often, and it, it kind of has become this magic phrase. Um, but it doesn't really, you know, it has a very definite legal meaning, but more often than not, it's, it's misused internally. So we, we try to get our developers to not use the term public domain unless it truly, truly is public domain. You know, something may be open source, something may be free software, something may be third party software, but only use the word public domain for something that explicitly is declared itself public domain. Um, you know, you, we sometimes hear people say, oh, we're safe, we don't ship our software. Uh, what I, I find is really amazing is when we're doing merger and acquisition scans and somebody says, oh, we're a pure software as a service company, and we ask a couple 
pointed questions. You know, are you sure you've never shipped this? What about your largest customer? And then everybody then says, oh, you know, except for company A or company B, you know, usually very large companies, oh, we've shipped them a, a private, a private version, private version of this. Well, suddenly you're no longer software as a service. You are a classic distribution company. So um, it, it's very rare that people remain pure software as a service forever. And so sometimes you see that it ends up being a wild west because people say, oh, we're not going to ship our software. So you end up with a lot of software that you wouldn't probably have picked if you were shipping it as a classic distribution. And now your hands are tied. And, and sometimes you've made a case where you've actually shipped something that you probably shouldn't have. You didn't have the right applications. The, other, the last point I want to make on this slide here is just, just because somebody has produced open source, it does not mean that they are an expert on licensing. It's, you know, the same developers everyone is, is employing are also out there creating, creating open source. And there's a spectrum, just like there's a spectrum inside the organization, there's a spectrum outside the organization. And you, we will see things all the time that say something like, this is public domain under the terms of the GPL, which is just a contradiction in, in terms. Or this is, um, uh, this is GPL software, but you are not allowed to use it for commercial purposes. Well, they, they use one phrase, but then they, they modify it in a way that you're technically not allowed to um, with another. So just because they, they are the open source author, just because they, they, they've given you code, doesn't mean that they are an expert on the terms of the license. I, I do say that you should, you should listen to what they say, because I think intent is often as important, if not more important, than the actual legalese. If, if a developer says, here's what, here's what my intent on sharing software with you is, and there's a lot of restrictions that even if you don't agree with, you should believe that they're going to care. So if somebody says this is GPL, but uh, you're not allowed to use it for commercial purposes, I would treat it like that. I would, you know, you, maybe you could fight them in court and, 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 and show that they don't have the ability to re remove that restriction. But um, I, in general, I'd say move on. You know, listen, listen to them when they talk to you. And if they tell you something important, listen to it. Move on if you can't comply. Maybe ask them a question. You know, are you sure you really mean this? You know, here's what we think. It's great to have a dialogue, especially if your hands are not tied by shipping it already. But if you don't like, you know, first off, they don't owe you an answer. And B, if, you know, if they give me an answer you don't like, you can move on. Okay. Um, i do one more slide here and then pass it back to Roman here for some final questions. So, you know, why aren't people tracking open source? And I, I, I always like bringing this up because it, we, we, you, know, you see from the poll answers, everybody is very excited about it, everybody's very interested in it, they want to get it done, that's why we're on the webinar today. But there's a, there can be some inertia in organizations. Well, why am I doing this? Um, I just want to ship. Well, you know, so most organizations I see, no matter how good you are, no matter how many scans you're doing, most organizations are still not tracking 90% of their code. Um, there's a long tail of technical debt out there. We, there's a lot of code that still hasn't been scanned. A lot of bit, uh, internal projects that haven't been looked at. Maybe they've been looked at very high levels, not low levels. So there's a time issue. There's a there's a there's a budget issue. There's a there's a resource, you know, human resource issue. Who has enough experience to do this? Uh, who who has whose responsibility is it? Are they also responsible for programming or release management, etc.? Um, we also see that many, if not most, organizations are not respecting the attribution license. Uh, a lot of companies are doing scans and they say, okay, we got rid of all the GPL code that we can't use and we paid for all the commercial licenses, but their about box is still empty. They haven't complied with the attribution style licenses like the BSD or the MIT. I, I think that's going to be one of our next battles here, which is making sure that we're doing full compliance and that we're respecting all licenses, not just viral licenses. Um, there's things that are being tra tracked by other teams. The, the, the IT team or your DevOps team are, are very often important members of, of your entire release, but they don't often get talked to. So you might be talking to your developers who tell you what's going on inside your application. But you may have a full software stack, including uh, databases, web servers, Linux devices, etc. Figure out who those people are. You know, this is the, continue the conversation. What does it actually take for our product to get out the door? Do we put it on some sort of device? Does our customer install it? Are there end user responsibilities around databases or other things? Do, do get everybody together in a conference room, watch and install. That's always very interesting. Go, go out with your professional services team for a day. Really eye-opening for many organizations. And then, and then you, 
it's very common to have a very, very deep software stack, especially if you are shipping any sort of Linux appliance uh, or shipping a, a VM image, things like that. Um, investigate your stack. And, and I think one of the things that we're seeing here in the community is what is our responsibility to the stack? If we are shipping Linux, what are we expected to, 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 to show and handle? And I think that's going to be a, a long, we're going to have a few more webinars about that this summer here about Linux compliance that you may be interested in. But it, it's definitely a, a very interesting and, and somewhat heavyweight um, process. And what we're all trying to do is figure out how do we do it correctly so the community is happy, but at the same time, not everybody is out there uh, redoing work, you know, uh, reviewing millions of lines, millions of files, and millions of lines of code. So with that, I'm going I'm to um, turn this back to Roman in the interest of time. And um, I think there's a few questions up here as well. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so what we are going to do right now is we will uh, run one more poll. And this poll will be followed by two uh, survey questions just to get your feedback on uh, what do you think about the webinar. And then we will close it with the last final question from the audience. So the last remaining uh, poll question, I'm going to run it right now. All right, thank you, everyone. I'm going to close this uh, poll and share the results with you. All right, well, thank you very much for answering this uh, poll question. Now I will uh, ask two more survey questions. This will be the feedback that uh, you can give us uh, for this webinar. All right, thank you, everyone. And uh, one last survey question, just to get uh, your feedback. So these are the results of the current one. Thank you, everyone. So uh, at this point, I would like to uh, I would like to ask the last final question from uh, the audience, and I'm going to uh, share my slides right now. So um, I would like uh, both uh, Edward and Jeff to uh, comment on this uh, question. So uh, I'll start with Edward. So the question is: Are there cases where the use of GPO does not have viral effect. Uh, for example, when the open source is fully independent from the proprietary program. Yeah, there can be. Um, 
uh, and essentially if there's you know really minimal interaction between the programs and you can say essentially that they're just being shipped uh, you know together on the same medium or something like that uh, this is a very uh, sort of technical deep technical problem most of the time uh, if there's any kind of interaction between GPL code particularly GPL um, you know, V2, um, V3 is uh, even is even trickier. Um, there's there's going to be um, there's a good chance that the obligations of the license are going to uh, uh, extend to uh, other code. And, th and thank you very much, um, Jeff. Do you have any? Yeah, and I was just going to add. You know, this is, this is very commonly seen when people are doing distributions of their product, where they may have their product, but then they may have something that's a tool that goes along. Um, sometimes you'll hear the term mirror aggregation, uh, seen in some of the licenses, which says, you know, you're shipping a CD that has a thing in one place and a thing in a separate place. They just happen to be in the same, you know, on the same CD, but they're not linked together, they're not interacting together. Uh, so there may not be a, a viral or copyleft interaction between the two. Um, it is important to remember, though, if you're ever shipping anything that has a copyleft or so-called viral license, you still need to respect those, that license for that, that thing. So say that you're shipping you know, maybe a utility that was GPL, like a word processor or text editor. And it was licensed under the GPL license, but it's not linking to any of your products. If you're shipping it, you're still responsible for providing, say, the copying file, the disclosure. Uh, uh, either the source code with the distribution or written offer good for three years, whatever the license may be, uh, for the source code. So uh, even though there might be not an, a viral interaction between your code and it, you still you still have the obligations if you're shipping somebody's uh, uh, say GPL license uh, content just to, within the box itself. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so. I can see we're kind of running out of time right now. So um, if you have any more questions, please don't hesitate to send them over to me. Uh, Jeff or Edward, will, uh, we're more than happy to answer your questions offline. Um, at this point, I would like to thank everyone for attending the webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Edward, for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. And Jeff, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, we are going to do more of these webinars, so please stay tuned uh, and uh, have a great day.